So the thing is, the desire to fly, right, is an idea handed down to us uh, by our ancestors, who in their grueling travels across trackless lands in prehistoric times, uh, looked enviously on the birds soaring high above, freely through space, at full speed, above all obstacles on the infinite highway of the air. Sounds like a damn good quote, right? The thing is, this is not my line. This is by the great Wilbur Wright, one of the two uh, Wright brothers, in fact. So good afternoon, everyone. This is your captain speaking. I'm Captain Aman Jauri, a helicopter pilot and aviator, and just a wide-eyed child at heart who still, at this age, ends up marveling at anything that goes airborne. To start off, uh, I would like to first thank you for joining me here today to explore the fascinating realm of unmanned versus manned technology. That's what I'm here to talk to you about. You know, as we stand on the precipice of a new era in flight, it is essential to delve into the significance of both piloted as well as autonomous unmanned systems in the ever-evolving aviation landscape. It keeps changing throughout, right? So many years ago, I used to build uh, aero models, actually as a student in this very school. Um, there used to be tiny little dumb planes, you know, without a flight computer or any of these fancy sensors that you see today, right? It used to take me weeks to design one. Uh, with some plastic parts I found lying around the house, uh, some of the kabara as my mom used to call it, and uh, just balsa wood that I used to get from my craft kits. Now, balsa wood may be very flimsy as a material, but it gives me two big advantages. It's light and it's cheap, right? So, with a very rudimentary radio receiver and transmitter, you know, I used to combine all of this together, and I used to, you won't believe it, I used to get a range of full 50 meters on this aircraft. And uh, it used to fly, you won't believe it, for full six minutes, right? Two hours to charge this small lithium battery overnight for six minutes of pure bliss. For six minutes, you know, I was the king of the skies at this very ground right here, when I used to fly these little birds. And what I just described to you is my first love affair. And the first time I fell in love with flying as a kid. Nearly 20 years later today, I design and build extremely complicated aircrafts. Proper unmanned aerial vehicles, or you may have heard of as drones, right? From 50 grams all the way to 0.5 tons all of weight. From shooting your weddings, events, to controlling air pollution in the city, to autonomously spraying over crops in farmlands, to protecting the sensitive Indian borders. The machines I built today are helping transform the Indian economy in real time. Right? Those 50 meters, by the way, are now 5,000 kilometers. I can fly my drones in Dubai sitting right here in Mumbai, in real time. The six minutes are now six days without the need to land or refuel. Such are these aircrafts. And that balsa wood, by the way, is now next generation composite, Kevlar and carbon fiber, that can absorb radar waves and transform to complete stealth, right? But here's the thing, this transformation didn't really happen overnight. Let me take you further back about where I am and where did I start with. I was born actually right outside the airport. Well, I don't mean on the road outside the airport. What I mean is directly outside the Jew airport, Nanavati Hospital. I was literally born to the sound of the beating rotors of a helicopter. Right? I come from a family of aviation professionals, engineers and operators alike. And over the last few years, I've spent my time designing and developing modern aircrafts that can solve real problems. I'm an astronautics engineer with specialization in jet propulsion, rocket engines and space sciences. That's what I spent my time doing. I've been flying helicopters for a few years now. I'm also one of India's very first DGCA licensed UAV pilot instructors. I run one of the country's largest drone academies right here in the heart of Mumbai city. And I'm here today to talk to you about the world of unmanned aviation. And there's a lot of misconception there. And why the tech I'm building is basically all set to make my job obsolete. And pave the way to make safer, better, more accessible skies for everyone around us, right? Let me talk to you a little bit about pilots. Now, I've never looked at flying as a profession really. It's a way to navigate my way into the lap of Mother Nature. Up there, I can tell you this, down here we have our bosses, up there Mother Nature is your boss, right? And uh, there's, by the way, a difference between a pilot and an aviator. One's a technician and an aviator is, uh, you know, an artist in love with flight. That's what it is. And as aviators, we are trained to be in sync with the machines. Much like how uh, there are parents in the audience, right? Like, Parents know exactly what's the meaning of what a noise a baby makes very early on. Similarly, our human ability as pilots consists of recognizing every abnormal light, every abnormal sound, even the slightest of vibrations and movements of our aircraft. We are one with a machine when we are flying. And there's a popular saying, hills, helicopter and weather never go together. 
you know, and weather can be pretty unforgiving, very fast. Turbulence is real. And emergencies in aviation too, right, can happen anytime, anywhere, to anyone. And I've faced a real, few real-life emergencies in the cockpit during my career as well. So us aviators possess this unique ability to detect something abnormal and quickly act on it. The split second between identifying the problem and then deciding to act on it, it's called aeronautical decision making or ADM. It's actually a very, very well documented process which includes combining hundreds of physiological, psychological and scientific factors to ensure that there's a guarantee safe end result. You wonder why pilots have the kind of salaries they do, right? It's because of ADM. The response time in a light helicopter, the, the one that I fly, is typically less than 14 seconds before the situation becomes irreversible, before you basically die, right? Let me slow down what an emergency is from the view of a pilot, right? Panic can quickly set in. Your throat dries up, your stomach gets very queasy, and believe it when I tell you, suddenly the houses start getting bigger from the cockpit, right? Your heart tells, tells your mind that it's time to act now. Your body basically goes in a fight or flight mode. In an instant, the sum total of all your knowledge and experience in your career comes to bear. You use that information and then you act on it. That process is called decide. That's detect, estimate, choose, identify, do, and then evaluate. It's a very, very well documented process into how to avert an emergency. This ability you know, to make split second decisions, adapt to unforeseen circumstances, and respond to the dynamic nature of the skies has been a hallmark of manned aviation. In fact, modern aircrafts come equipped with more than 25 computers on board that assist the pilot in almost every aspect of flying, whether it's planning, whether in route, uh, takeoffs and landings, literally anything else. I can turn on my autopilot now and I can land one inch, hover one inch above the ground. I can do that today. But that being said, ADM is this process is often influenced by factors that may not be immediately apparent to a computer, such as the ability to read very subtle environmental cues and will basically gauge the emotional state of the passengers with you, right? It's a very popular saying, we all start flying with a bag full of luck and an empty bag of experience. The goal in your career should be to fill the bag of experience before the bag of luck runs out, right? And it runs out pretty fast. In aviation, all takeoffs are optional, but all landings are mandatory, right? Now let me understand the value of a pilot and what we do in the cockpit. Let's take a look at what our robot friends are really capable of, right? Just a few years ago, I'm talking not less than 10 years ago, UAV brains, the flight computers, could only measure 3D points in space, X, Y, and Z. Just very basic binary integers with terrible tolerance to, you know, so they would at best act as proofs of concept for an end user and application. Today, these birds are able to compute complex ballistic trajectories. They can define their own path dynamically in space. The truth is, and you may hear this a lot, drones are not the future, they are very much the present. You know, laws and rules are basically made for technology that evolve over time. Like, it happened with the solar and IT industries in India, for example, many, many years ago. And most of you weren't even born by then. But drones is a sunshine sector for most countries around the world today, including India. This technology is revolutionizing way faster than we're able to catch up, right? The last few decades have witnessed like an exponential growth in the capabilities of these machines, of UAVs, right? One of the most significant advantage of a UAV is its increased autonomy. And unmanned birds operate with very sophisticated sensors, you know, artificial intel intelligence algorithms and machine learning capabilities that allow them to perceive their environment, make decisions and adapt to changing conditions without constant human intervention or what we call human in the loop, right? By the way, no pilot ever wants to be called a drone pilot. That's like an insult because the computer does most of your job, right? See, these modern UAVs are built with obstacle avoidance, geofencing, intelligent flight path formation, autonomous flight termination, and so many advanced features like return to safety in the event of failure, basically, right? So UAVs can now fly longer distances, operate in areas that are, you know, inaccessible to humans. And this has opened up a wide array of new possibilities for applications such as long-range surveillance, weather monitoring, environment monitoring, and even global delivery networks. Let me come to that in a bit. Unmanned aviation has found its applications in all of these sectors, like I told you. Agriculture, right, search and rescue, infra inspection, package deliveries, whatever. So this ability of drones to access these very, very hard to reach areas without risking human lives is where this value is of a drone in the realm of aviation. Now let me give you an example with this, right? Mumbai city has a massive problem of malaria and dengue, assuming all of us are from Mumbai. And uh, rainwater gets trapped every year in roof gutters, specifically in Lower Parel and you know town areas. So it's a very, very big problem, right? 
So my company ran a city-wide program in 2021. It was piloted by us of spraying anti-malaria medicine over these waterlogged sites with drones. With, believe it or not, 100 times the precision and accuracy compared to a manual effort. We used AI, we spotted where the water is, my drone reached that area, sprayed the insecticide and got back, right? It was the first time something like this happened in India. And I know it seems like a rudimentary operation, but as a result, the malaria, malaria case load reported by the health department, Maharashtra and BMC that year, dropped by more than 60% that year in 2021. And that's the advantage. Today, as you all know, this is standard practice in Mumbai City. This happens every year, right? Drones can help bring such a huge social impact in society as well. Now, let me give you a more fun example, something that you might all like. Now, imagine traveling from Kandavali to, let's say, a Mahalakshmi racecourse helipad in just 15 minutes. 15 minutes, 1-5, I don't mean 5-0. It's not even possible 5-0. I mean 1-5. The unmanned air taxis of today are more than capable of doing this. Very soon, in a few years, you'll be able to book a taxi like this on your phone, which will land somewhere very close to your house, right? You'd get in, it'll autonomously take off, all the while you're in your cockpit enjoying your favorite TV show, maybe an episode of Friends, right? And this air taxi in real time is computing terabytes of weather data, flight path obstacles, air traffic control, it's communicating with the aircraft surrounded, all of this while being airborne in real time. Using advanced artificial intelligence and cascaded neural network machine learning algorithms, this modern flight computers do a great job of replacing a pilot's standard workload, right? So now comes the fundamental question. What can't this technology replace? What can it not do, right? Let me talk to you about fusion of these two together. Now, this might be a little bit of a serious example, but I've been a part of a professional audit team that was conducting a deep investigation into a helicopter crash, very recently in the Mumbai High region. In the middle of a very heavy rainstorm in a C-86 condition, C-86 is the worst, by the way, this helicopter crashed into the ocean amidst uh, poor visibility and bad weather conditions. Four passengers lost their lives that day in an unfortunate accident. However, three survived. Could a fully autonomous flying bird would have prevented this crash, you think? You know, we spent nearly 90 days exploring these options, really investigating, going deep down the systems and processes that led up to the crash, this air crash investigation. And the biggest factor, you will not believe it, that resulted in the survival of these three occupants. While they were floating in water, they were hanging on for dear life because search and rescue could not reach them in time, were the constant words of motivation and encouragement from the pilot to the passengers. These pilots were ex-military. They jumped into the water with these passengers and they kept talking to them, kept motivating them, pushing their survival instincts to take over in the face of a crisis. Right? Before submitting my final observations to the committee 90 days after that, I added a small phrase at the end of my report. I said, decisions taken in the face of adversity must always be respected. A pilot or more importantly, the human's will to survive is something a computer cannot accurately break down in numbers and algorithms. Not in the reality we live in today at least, maybe in a Black Mirror episode somewhere, right? And this survival instinct quite literally becomes the difference between life and death in crisis. Flying isn't dangerous. Well, helicopters make people, you know, anxious. Flying isn't dangerous. Crashing is, right? And any decision that can directly connect with survival requires the presence of emotion. Until such a time as AI can accurately process these emotions, you know, to laser-like accuracy, a human will always be needed in the loop. It's commonly said that pilots of today are computer supervisors, you know. And we often used to joke in our pilot academy many years ago, we used to say we fly choppers with our heads, not with our hands and feet, right? So the question still remains, can you or will you, more importantly, fly with 180 fellow passengers from Mumbai to Delhi in a flight run only by algorithms? Would you do it today? Rather than viewing uh, manned and unmanned aviation as competing forces, as you know, two areas of the spectrum, this is a growing recognition for the potential of collaboration. Right? Both systems bring unique strengths to the table, and a symbiotic relationship could lead to a safer, more efficient, more reliant airspace overall. Right? Although, yeah, the integration of unmanned systems into pilot training and simulation programs today offers a valuable bridge between manned and unmanned aviation. This is where the value really comes in. This allows pilots to familiarize themselves with operations, interactions of autonomous systems, fostering a deeper understanding of their capabilities and limitations. You would want your pilot to understand computers, right? That's kind of the basic. Not just fly with a yoke, but actually understand what that system is doing. Now let's talk about risk and safety, and how these concepts come into place will help build a more accountable 
aviation space in the future. So the immediate future of someone like me, you know, who takes off and lands at the Juhu airport on a daily basis, uh, is like uh, dealing with multiple drones in my shared airspace. Five years ago, I'm not talking very far off, just five years ago, as I was taking off the Juhu airport runway, which faces towards Juhu beach, I used to be dealing with birds, and if this was January, February, March, I was dealing with kites. That's kind of the problem, right? But today it means spotting small photography drones and steering clear of them to avert unnecessary risks in the cockpit. Because let's face it, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old and bold pilots. That doesn't work, right? As unmanned aviation continues to proliferate and grow, regulatory frameworks play a very critical role in ensuring the safety and accountability of both these systems, both of them alike. Striking the balance between, let's say, fostering innovation and mitigating risks on two sides is a very complex task. It requires collaboration between industry stakeholders, regulatory bodies, the aviation community, and the entire globe, to be honest, right? We all have heard about the 737 MAX crashes, right? It just didn't happen in one country or with one airline. It happened with the world. Now, I've spent a few years of my life sitting on policy and regulatory panels with the government of India, with the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Civil Aviation on building these regulations. And these regulations need to adapt to the evolving landscape of unmanned aviation. Drones are a reality now, and most of us would have one in our homes now today, right? The good news is that India is leading this race when it compared to other advanced countries. Our drone regulation is less than 14 pages long. Other countries have 600 or 700 pages, right? Drone regulations in India are actually one of the most easily navigable set of rules in the world, not just this Asia alone, right? And as this tech advances, regulatory frameworks must keep pace to address these new challenges and ensure that unmanned systems can be integrated safely in our airspace alongside manned aircraft. So both my jobs are safe. Right? In conclusion, the future of aviation is not a dichotomy between manned and unmanned flight, but rather a convergence of their strengths. The human touch in cockpit, believe me, remains indispensable. Offering a level of, let's say, adaptability, intuition and decision-making promise that technology, to be fair, is yet fully to replicate. You can look at this TEDx talk maybe five years from now and laugh at me. I hope that happens because tech would have advanced to that level. Simultaneously, the advancements of unmanned technology, it prevents, uh, you know, all this innovation on the human side, the errors on the human side to go further. It represents a leap forward in our capacity to explore, monitor and operate environments that were once deemed inhospitable. For example, you can now fly a drone in the Chernobyl area, where you know humans can't really practically enter. So embracing this evolution requires a collaborative effort. Like I said, it combines the best of both to navigate the skies of tomorrow. <coughs> as we look ahead, let us not see unmanned and manned aviation as adversaries, but as partners in the pursuit of a safer, more efficient, more accessible flight for everyone. Together with a harmonious blend of human expertise and cutting-edge technology, we can soar to new heights, usher in an era where the skies truly know no limits. And let me tell you, in aviation, after all, the sky isn't the limit, it's the goddamn view. Yes. Thank you so much and Jayan.